All righty, and good morning. And before I get started, I'd love to have a little bit of uh, input from you and a little bit of feedback from you. So just my first question to you, just how many of you over the past one year, three years, five years, you've taken on more work, your workload has increased? Is that everybody, huh? <laughs> And then, how many of you, just to give me an idea, you directly oversee a team, or you supervise a team, you have people directly reporting to you? And about half of you. How many of you, um, you feel as if you just don't have enough time to get to all the things you need to get to on a daily basis? That could be here, could be at home. And then my final question. How many of you, you leave work, at least on a regular basis, feeling complete and accomplished? Not many. Okay. Well, I got great news. You're normal. Why don't you give yourself a round of applause, huh? Yeah. Yeah, as you guys can see up here, it says the busy professional's formula to self-care. And I chose those words very carefully. Busy professional, obviously that is you. Formula, one definition of formula is a prescription or a recipe. And I think it's safe to say if we all had the same recipe sitting in front of us, and we had the necessary ingredients, we had adequate resources, I think if we followed those instructions, we would all come out with a like or similar result. Agree or really agree? Absolutely. And here's my guarantee, here's my big bold statement. When you apply what is discussed today, when you apply, I'm not saying that this session is going to change your life, but I am saying the application of this information, when you do apply this, you are gonna experience less frustration, you will achieve more balance, you're going to be more fulfilled. You're going to experience more joy here on the job, at home, as well as with life. Because I know at times you feel like you're just out there on this deserted island all by yourself, right? Nobody understands you. Nobody understands your demands. Nobody can relate, except for maybe Wilson. But nobody, you know, nobody relates. Nobody understands. But what I want you to know is that you're not alone. And unfortunately, in today's day and age, this has become the norm. I mean, what we're experiencing today, uh, overwhelm, overload, that has now become the norm. And uh, what I've also come to realize is that, you know, life is just a continual process of ebbs and flows. It's like we have times in life where things are smooth. We have times in life when things are rocky, but that's life. But the cool thing is this. You get through that, you weather the storms, we come out better, we come out stronger, we grow and we develop as people. There's no, no way that we can't. It's, uh, that's how our life lessens, that's how we learn, that's where wisdom comes from. And as human beings, we're pretty elastic. We either shrink as people, or we grow, we develop, and we become more. And I guess the one thing that really bothers me about today, and maybe it's always been this way, the one thing that really bothers me is that I see people who are, they're completely overwhelmed. And they're taking on more and more, they're emotionally, physically, mentally, they're exhausted. And then they'll say things like, well, at least I got a job. Or they'll say, I'm just, I'm grateful I have a job. And I'm not saying that I'm, I'm a very grateful person myself, but I'm saying, that's not living, that's surviving, barely but it's not living. So today, I'd really like to talk to you about taking charge, taking charge of your life, thriving, becoming more, becoming more as a person, becoming more fulfilled, becoming more accomplished, and having a greater impact. And not only becoming more as a person, but like I said, having a greater impact, because I think that's the greatest gift that you can provide, especially in this environment, is to be able to impact those that you lead, impact and influence the young minds of this community, of this institution, and to really be able to impact the future of this institution through today's actions. So who am I and what qualifies me to lead today's discussion? Well, as you heard, I've been at this for about 16 years now, and I, my primary role is that of a personal trainer as well as a well coach. And a lot of people refer to me as a productivity coach. You know, they'll call, call me up and they'll say, you know what? I want to get more out of life. You know, I just, I, I want to become more. I want to be more productive. And this very much includes helping people not only become healthier physically, but also psychologically. And that also includes really helping people to prioritize their day so that they're making the necessary investments in themselves 
to achieve more balance and to become more fulfilled and to become more productive. I'm sure most people in here, you guys know what a, the role of a personal trainer. Most people aren't really familiar with the role of a well coach. And well coaching really is just, it's the study and the practice of wellness. Another way to say that, it's the study and the practice of self-care. And I'm sure that you guys know this, probably the greatest means to learning is to teach. And I've had a great opportunity over the past several years to really learn a lot about myself. By no means have I achieved mastery, but I will tell you I've grown, I've developed, I've evolved as a person, and I'm really excited to be here with you today because I'm excited to share with you some of the habits I've picked up, some of the changes I've made, because I know and I, I really believe that you can benefit from this as well. Um, before I get to that, what I'd like to do, I just want to kind of share a little bit of a, of a personal story with you. And as I indicated earlier, you know, life is really full of these ebbs and flows. We have times in our life where things are smooth, times in our life when things are rocky. And over the last five to seven years, I'd say it's probably been some of the most challenging years of my life. Uh, it started actually back in 2005. Uh, my wife and I had been married for several years, and you know, life was good. It was like a new chapter in my life. I had just been married, and uh, this was 2005. It was in the spring, and my brother-in-law, who's my sister's brother, was building a house down on the Chesapeake Bay. And her father, my father-in-law, at the time, he was retired, and he was a typical retired father looking for something to do. So he went from Philadelphia down to Chesapeake Bay, Maryland, to help his son build this home. And I don't know what they were doing. They were waiting for a window shipment or um, you know, something. I know they were waiting for a delivery. And they were cleaning up the site. And my father-in-law bends down. He picks up an extension cord. And he starts walking backward. Well, he lost sight of where he was at. And he ended up walking right into the hole that went from the first floor down to the basement. That was the hole where the staircase was going to be cut, um, or where the staircase was going to be laid. So he came down on the, uh, came down on the concrete slab. Um, suffered a severe head injury, uh, fractures to the face, the spine, uh, the skull, life-threatening situation, had to be life flighted. Um, he did survive. He survived the fall. And just like it happens so many times, you know, we see people who are recovering. It looks like they're out of the woods. Um, unfortunately, one month after that, he had died. He, he, he passed from a pulmonary embolism. And something that we weren't expecting that. You know, we, weren't, we didn't plan for that one. We had only been married for three years, and my wife had lost her father. It was a very, very challenging time. About a year after that, uh, my wife and I, we brought our first child into the world. And this was great. You know, it changed the focus. And this, you know, things began to kind of normalize and stabilize, and we had a new focus, had a lot of joy in our life. Um, and then my, uh, my daughter was two years old. When my daughter turned two years old, I remember uh, it was a beautiful spring evening. I think it was in May. Um, the house that we used to live in, the garage actually sat behind our house. And I remember it was such a nice evening. I saw my wife come home from work one evening, and she pulls in the driveway, drives behind the house, and goes to the garage. And it was so nice, I decided I would go out and greet her that evening. Well, I walk out the back uh, glass sliding door. My wife gets out of the car, and she's physically shaking. And she looks at me and she says, hey, Scott, she says, my mother's breast cancer is back. And she said, it's bad. You know, this time it's really bad. And sure enough, it was. A year after receiving the news, she loses her mother. And that was about two weeks before our second daughter was born. Um, this is where things got tough. You know, this is where things got really heavy. Um, we were... My wife had just lost her mother. She, you know, she really didn't have an opportunity to properly grieve the loss of her mother. We had a new child in the house. My three-year-old daughter is trying to cope with a new baby in the house. Uh, we're sleep deprived. Um, financially, we're a little strapped because my wife had spent some time with you know, her mother during her mother's final days. Then she goes on maternity leave. But in our house, nobody's doing well, including me. Uh, and that's when I really started to experience for the first time in my life this overwhelming anxiety. Um, so I came up with a novel idea. I decided I'm going to treat this with alcohol. And um, it's not something I'm proud of. It's not something I'm happy about. But it is something that happened. 
So I went through this nine month cycle of, um, you know, just feeling this overwhelming anxiety, like somebody sitting on my chest. I come home every night and, you know, it didn't really scare me how much I was drinking, but the thing that really, you know, scared me was that I realized I was starting to become dependent upon this. So my typical cycle was I'd, I'd come home from work and have a couple beers and I'd relax, but that affected my sleep. So I'd get up in the morning and I'd pound coffee all day and then I would be even more anxious. So I'd come home and I would just continue this cycle. And that's really um, about after about nine months of this is when I decided, you know, it's, it, it's, it's time to play grown up and it's try, time to take responsibility. And that's when I got into well coaches. But like I said, uh, I established some new habits. I established some new ways of doing things. Um, and I think I've got some good benefit to provide to you here today. So we ask, what is self-care? You know, self-care, like I said, is just the mastery of wellness. It can be considered the mastery of self-care. Um, and self-care can be defined as a way of living that incorporates behaviors that enable one to maintain personal health and balance, replenish energy and motivation, and grow as a person. Why would we even be interested in self-care? Well, you look your best, you feel your best, you function your best, you perform your best when you're experiencing more positive emotions more often. That's a fact. It can't be disputed. There's a plethora of research to support this. So the objective is this. We spend more time on that left-hand column than we do over here on the right. Now, that's not to say that we don't need negative emotions. We actually do need negative emotions to remain healthy as, a, as an individual, as a human being. But what the research shows is that there's something called the positivity ratio. And the positivity, positivity ratio says that we should experience about three positive emotions to every one negative emotion. That's the tipping point. That's the point where we go from just getting by, being a little stressed, doing OK, to totally being alive, to taking charge, and to living life. And when we experience this, when we experience more positive em emotions more often, we feel good. We experience self-care. And it does. It feels good to feel good. And the broaden and build theory shares with us that when people have more positive emotions, they're more creative, they're more powerful, they're more productive, and they're more likely to think outside the box. Anybody in here like to be more powerful, creative, productive? Yeah, absolutely. And when you are more powerful, when you're more productive, when you're more creative, do you think that might resonate with your staff, your team? Absolutely it does. And when you're stressed, you're overwhelmed, you're burnt out, you think your team might feel that as well? Absolutely. So how do we do this? You know, how do we experience more positive emotions more often? How do we actually tap into this? It's real simple, <laughs> and I've created a five-step formula. And I'll tell you, this five-step formula, you, you stick with this. You will stay grounded. The reality is, though, when you find yourself stressed, when you find yourself out of balance, and you don't have to do all five of these perfectly, and actually what I'm going to recommend is that you don't. And maybe we can just make a little agreement today. Maybe today we'll just go ahead and we'll just, we'll just input and we'll apply one thing. Just apply one thing that we discussed today. And in doing so, you're going to build up your confidence. You will build up your self-efficacy. You're more likely to take that next step and the next step and the next step. So I'm saying you don't have to do all five, but you do have to be aware of all five. You do have to be conscious of all five. Because I can assure you that when you're stressed, when you're overwhelmed, when you're out of balance, it's because one or all five of these are being neglected. So before I get to the five, here's what I need. To, I need to see everybody's hand. Everybody go ahead and put your hand up for me. And what I want to point out, what I want to share with you is this hand, it symbolizes so many things. The hand is very powerful. I mean, it could symbolize stop, right? But if we throw it up a little bit higher, we're going high five. It's just a simple change. We extend that hand. It's a very caring hand. It's a helping hand. It's a healing hand. You make a fist. This thing symbolizes power. It symbolizes strength. But this open right hand also depicts protection throughout many societies throughout history. And what I want you guys to do, go ahead and just take a look at your hand. Flip that hand over. I want you guys to actually examine your hand. I want you guys to take a really, really good look at that hand. And look at all the fine details from the fingerprints to the length of your fingers, the color, the size of the palm, 
the hand or the lines that run through that palm. And what I want you to understand is that hand that you're looking at right now, that thing serves so many people from friends, family, colleagues, your community. But starting today, this hand is going to serve as an anchor to care for the single most important person in the world, and that's you. And what I want you to do, take your non-dominant hand. I want you guys to slap that right down in the middle of your page. And I want you to trace your hand. You know how those kids do those little turkeys around Thanksgiving time? And again, this sheet of paper, more importantly, your hand is going to serve as a reminder for self-care by meeting your needs. So if you're right-handed, you trace your left hand. On the pinky finger, on the left finger, I want you to write the, the letter N. Ring finger E, middle finger E, index finger D, your thumb is S. You would do the opposite if you're left-handed. This is real simple. Again, you meet your needs, you're going to experience more positive emotions more often. You fail to meet your needs, you're going to experience more negative emotions. It's that simple. By the way, why did I give you guys only one sheet of paper to take notes? The truth is, the fact of the matter is, the research shows after today, only 1% of you will look at this again. And you're going to forget about 70 to 75% of the information that's discussed today by tomorrow. So what you're going to do, you're going to take this one sheet of paper and you guys are going to hang this in your office in a place where you can see it, in a place where others can see it so they can ask you about it and they're going to inquire about this. And you can share with them how you're taking better care of yourself, how you're meeting your needs, and you can explain to them exactly what you're doing. But the first one's this, is nutrition. So allow me just to share with you the principles that I teach my clientele, my seminar attendees. Now understand this, most people who seek me out, they're looking for a weight loss effect. But an interesting thing happens, a funny thing happens about three days, seven days into applying these weight loss principles. What clients and people notice is that their energy is improving. What they notice is that they're handling stress better. They notice that that energy is more stable, it's consistent. Their energy at 4 o'clock p.m. is about the same as it is at 10 a.m. They notice that they're just feeling better in general. The, 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 the anxieties, are, they're, they're thinking more clearly. They just seem sharper. So before I get to the actual principles, um, what I'd like to do is, you know, I don't, like I said, I, I guess I, I primarily work with the weight loss population, but I really don't even teach people how to lose weight. What I teach them how to do is to build and boost metabolism. And a, side, uh, a byproduct of that or a side effect is weight loss. But when I talk about metabolism, there's really three components that everybody has absolute control over. And the first one's the amount of muscle that they have on their body. We know as we go through the aging process, if we don't do anything, we will lose muscle. We also know that it, we can only gain so much muscle. We can't continue to keep gaining muscle forever. The second one is the rate at which you oxidize nutrients. How quickly you convert nutrients into heat or energy. That's just a fancy way for saying how quickly do you take the foods that you eat and convert those into heat or burn them up. We know some people convert those nutrients into heat or energy very slowly, and we call them the slow metabolism people. And then we know people convert these nutrients into heat or energy very quickly. And what do we call them? Bitch. Right? <laughs> and then the last one's this, the hormonal environment that you create, OK? And what I want you guys to understand is that we're all creating a specific hormonal environment based on what we put into our body and how we move our body. But what I think I can provide value with today is this. Two systems control your body. One's your nervous system. The other one's the endocrine system. So I just want to show you how you can optimize that through nutrition. But uh, these are the principles that I do teach. And we're primarily just going to focus on the first three. By the way, um, I will send these to you via email. Uh, not tomorrow, but give me till this weekend. Um, so I know Janelle has a sheet, a sign-up sheet. I also have some additional, uh, I got a video as well as a companion manual. If you guys are interested in that, just sign your name on the sheet and I'll send that to you via email. Um, but with the time that we have today, I'm not, obviously I'm not going to be able to go in too in depth. But the first thing is this, we need to eat and eat frequently. 
And when we do eat, we're going to be eating complete meals. So that would include some protein, some carbohydrates, fiber, essential fats. And then we're going to eat meals that are lower in sugar. So we're really focusing on these first three. And the reason why we're focusing on the first three is because those are going to specifically influence blood sugar control. Those are going to influence our endocrine system, and those are going to influence how we feel. But if we would take you know, a, a simple sugar, you know, something like this, this Coke, I think there's 70, 75 grams of sugar in this bottle. And let's say I were just to stand up here and drink the entire bottle. 75 grams of sugar in the bottle. Now there's 75 grams of sugar in my body. So at the moment, I got high blood sugar. Does that make sense to everybody? Well, every, we all have this brain that's very interested in keeping our blood levels on tight ranges. And the brain is very interested in homeostasis, wants to maintain stability. Right now, if we took your temperature, you're probably somewhere around 98.6 degrees. And if you got cold, what would happen? You would shiver, right, to help bring it back up to 98.6 degrees. You get too hot, you're working out, you begin sweating to cool you down. But the body is always interested in maintaining homeostasis. So same thing here. I just assaulted my bloodstream with sugar. The brain is looking to keep our blood sugar levels in pretty tight ranges. The brain just recognized blood sugar levels are way outside the range that I'm comfortable with. So the brain kind of freaks out, calls down to the pancreas and says, pancreas, there's too much sugar in the bloodstream. You need to do something. Pancreas says, no problem. I'm going to begin secreting this hormone called insulin. Insulin's a storage hormone. It will remove that blood sugar and bring it back down to a level that the brain is comfortable with. So insulin does its job. It's taking those sugar molecules somewhere, right? It's going to store them in the liver, store them in some muscle tissue, converts a lot as triglycerides or fats, and then stores it where? On your rear, your stomach, with the back of the arm, wherever you store fat. But our endocrine system, again, is is interested in maintaining homeostasis, so we have opposing hormones. If insulin goes up, that means glucagon goes down. The significance of that is glucagon's a release hormone. More specifically, that's the hormone that's responsible for releasing fat from a fat cell. But what you need to know is this. Anytime we assault our bloodstream with sugar, insulin levels go up. Now, once insulin does its job and brings blood sugar levels back down to a level that the brain is comfortable with, the brain says, cool, pancreas, you can stop secreting insulin. But it's no different than in the summertime when you're watering your garden, when you're watering your lawn. When you turn off the faucet, what's still in the hose? Water. So even though we've stopped production, we still have active amounts of insulin in the bloodstream. And insulin is a storage hormone, so it will, continually, it will continue to remove blood sugar. So now, subsequently, we've got low blood sugar, right? So here's the level that your, your body wants to maintain. We eat too many carbohydrates, too high in sugar. We're releasing all this insulin. We're storing body fat. And now insulin continues to do its job. Now our blood sugar levels are low. And when the blood sugar levels are low, of course, we have cravings, hunger, fatigue, we're irritable, that very much influences your state, right? It very much influences your level of positivity. It very much influences your ability to produce and your ability to be creative and productive. So ideally, what we would love to do is, again, apply these principles. When we're eating and eating frequently, when we're minimizing simple sugars, we begin stabilizing our blood sugar. And when we stabilize our blood sugar, not only are we better at staying lean, not only are we better at getting, you know, looking physically lean, but we're also in a really, really good state where we've got great thinking clarity. We're also in a really good state where we're productive. And you know, the reason, primarily, primarily the reason why we don't do things or why we procrastinate is because we don't feel like it, right? We're not experiencing a lot of positive emotions. You don't return a phone call because you don't feel like it. You don't follow up on something is because you don't feel like it. So ju by just simply committing to a little bit better nutrition, we automatically and immediately shift over here and we're experiencing more of these positive emotions. So what I'd like you to do at this moment, just take, we're going to take a minute. I want you guys to write down two things. What are two things that you could do to improve your nutrition. So this might, you know, in, 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 it might not even be something you want to do or feel like doing, but what could somebody in your situation do to improve their nutrition? And maybe that's eating breakfast, 
Maybe that's preparing some food and bringing that with you to work so you don't have to you know, go track down lunch and spend even more time. Somebody who doesn't have the time to, to spare. Okay, next is environment. And environment controls everything, everything, even at the cellular level. Dr. Bruce Lipton, who's instrumental in the, uh, the cloning of cells, was able to determine that your DNA doesn't control cellular activity or your biology. It's actually the environment. And environment controls everything. Like environment controlled how you dress today, right? I don't see anybody in a bathing suit. I don't, nobody uh, showed up like in their pajamas or a Snuggie or anything. Environment controls everything. So, you know, obviously those things, they, they wouldn't be uh, appropriate in this atmosphere. Environment controls how you drove your car today. Had it been snowing today, you would have drove very different. But environment controls everything. And, the, you know, the, to contradict myself, you know, environment controls everything, but one thing that we have control over is our environment. And, you know, for instance, you chose where to live, right? You chose your geographical location. And environment's a lot like habits. First you choose the habit, then the habit controls you. Same thing with environment. So you chose where to live. You chose wh who to partner with. You chose your work. You chose where to work. But in making those decisions, the environment then has a tremendous amount of control over you. So when we talk about environment, there's been a tremendous amount of study done on the Pima Indians. And there's two groups. Uh, one resides in Mexico, the other resides in Arizona. They both come from the same gene pool. And what the research shows is that the Mexican tribe, almost nobody's overweight and only 6% have diabetes. The Arizona tribe, about seven, or about, uh, I think it's about 75% of them are overweight and about 45% of them have diabetes. Same gene pool. And what the research has also found, and it's very clear, that if you take one out of the Arizona tribe, move them to Mexico, their health risk factors go down and vice versa. Take one out of Mexico, move them into Arizona, health risk factors go up. And it's only because the environment is different, right? Their food is different, their means to get the food is different, their activity is different. And there's, uh, there's a guy by the name of Dave Ramsey. And Dave Ramsey is in the financial industry, financial field. But he's got one of my favorite quotes Dave Ramsey uh, shares is that we need to create systems that make us do smart things. And for any of you, you've got an investment account, whether that be 401k or a child's uh, college education savings account, any type of forced savings account, you get it. That's a system that makes you do smart things, right? It's not as if you get a phone call at the end of the month and they say, you got any money this month? You feel like doing it this month? No, it's automatic, it's consistent, it's predictable, and as a result, you get the benefits of that particular habit. Same thing with those who use personal training services. That's a system that makes them do smart things. You know, if they're, they're, if they're training on Monday and Wednesday uh, at 9 a.m., they know in February where they're going to be Monday and Wednesday at 9 a.m. It's already scheduled. And it's a system that makes them do smart things. They're literally forced to do that habit. So then, in return, they actually reap the benefits of that habit. So we talk about this, in, you know, we talk about environment. We talk about these success systems. And actually, there was a guy by the name of Dan Kennedy. I heard him speak in Orlando a couple months ago. Uh, really cool story. He talks about he's lost 40 pounds over the past 10 or 20 years. And he said a big challenge of his, his big nemesis was donuts. And he said there was a donut shop between his house and his office. And every day he'd stop at the donut shop and pick up a donut. But then he began rationalizing and lying to himself and says, I'm not going to eat any. I'm just going to pick some up for the office staff. Of course, he brings them in. They're sitting there throughout the course of the day. He grabs a donut. But he knew that this was interfering with his overall weight loss goal. So he created a system of success. You know what he did? He sold his house. 
So now he no longer had a donut shop between his house and his office. A bit extreme? Yeah, absolutely. But was it a, success, a, a system that made him do smart things? Absolutely. Uh, me, one of my biggest challenges, I share an office with somebody. Um, I've also done a lot of research and a lot of study on um, just interruptions in general. And what I found is that if you are immersed in a project, something that requires a lot of concentration, and you're interrupted, it will take you about 20 minutes to get back to the same level of focus and concentration than you had before the interruption. We also have over 100 interruptions a day. So I share an office with somebody. So not only do I have my own distractions, but I have this individual. Their phone is ringing. People are stopping in to see them and chat with them. Um, so if I have a project, uh, one of the success systems I've created, I now either do it, I do it when they're not there. I'll do it early in the morning. I'll do it later in the evening. I'll do it on the weekends. Um, and the other thing I'll do is close the office door. And if I close the office door, the rest of the team knows that now is not a good time to interrupt. So I do that, turn the phone off, and you can get, uh, your, obviously, the produ productivity goes through the roof. I mean, you guys know, if you've got an hour or two or three hours of quiet, un uninterrupted time, how much you can get done. So again, I'd like you to kind of take a look at some of your environments, whether that would be the workplace, the home, uh, your social network, recreation time, leisure time. Um, just identify one or two things that you could do to improve your environment, to create some success systems, to become more productive, and really to meet your needs, to, to kind of play, uh, play the game on your terms. So this next E, it's got to be exercise, right? You guys know it's coming. Actually, at this point in the game, I hope you guys know that exercise is beneficial to your health, right? That's made it to Ashland, Ohio. Good, because if it hasn't, I certainly can't help you out. So the next E is actually expectations. Here's a great quote. Unagreed expectations are resentments waiting to happen. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Lack of or poor communication is by far one of the most unnecessary causes of frustration. Right? This lack of um, or poor communication, great cause of unnecessary frustration at work, at home, as well as in life. Without clear communication, we're bound to be frustrated. Now, as it pertains to self-care, we have standards and we have boundaries. Standards are what we would expect from ourselves. Boundaries are more so how we expect other people, you know, what we expect from other people, how we expect them to treat us, how we expect them to communicate with us. And the reality is, and the truth is, we really do teach people how to treat us, how to communicate with us. Uh, once you've identified the behaviors that you will not tolerate, it's important to communicate your boundaries to others. People will not know what to expect from you unless you teach them how to act in your presence. So if you don't educate other people on how you expect to be communicated with, you will become resentful. You will be frustrated and you will not be sufficiently caring for yourself. So asking and expecting others to treat you appropriately is a necessary step in learning to take care of yourself and allows you to develop healthy relationships to exhi exhibit self-respect and become a role model for others. So this plays a vital role in self-care as well as leadership. And so I'm going to ask you as a leader, how clearly are you communicating the expectations to your team? And if, 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 role, if the environment has changed and if resources have changed, positions are being eliminated. That means expectations or roles have changed. And it's not practical, nor is it possible for you to be the one to pick up all the slack. So is this being communicated to your team? And is the changing roles and are the changing expectations being communicated to your team? And I think you know, a common flaw in the workplace uh, is that just because you told somebody something one time, they got it. Uh, because I found out that's not the case. So core duties, um, job descriptions, responsibilities, those are things that need to be reviewed and they need to be reviewed often with your team, whether that's in a team setting or individually or both. 
because I know I've had this situation where uh, somebody's not meeting the standard. We have an employee who's not meeting the standard and I'm resentful, I'm upset. You know, I'm, either it's their professionalism or their behavior or their performance and so much that disciplinary action is required. So they receive written disciplinary action and then we come to find out they're resentful because they were never clear on the expectations in the first place. So unagreed expectations are resentments waiting to happen. And this will save you a tremendous amount of time as well as frustration. So um, how do we really enforce these boundaries? It's really a, a simple five-step formula, and I can send you this slide as well. It's inform, make a request, give a warning, follow through, and let go of the outcome. Um, and this could be anything from somebody. This example shows somebody that's speaking loudly or their, their voice, their tone of voice is unacceptable. Um, it could even be, you know, I have people who call me up and they're upset, and they're upset, they use profanity. Um, and that's just something, I don't, I don't tolerate that. You know, I love to help people, I know I can help them, um, but, I, you know, I'm not going to be attacked and I'm not going to listen to that type of language. So with the, in, you know, informing, I can, I point it out to people. I said, do you realize that you're, you know, you're using a lot of profanity? And more often than not, they'll say, yeah, you know what, I'm really sorry. Sometimes they say, yeah, absolutely, I realize I'm blank, 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 profanity, all this other stuff. Um, so then I make a request, you know, if it continues, um, I'm going to have to hang up the phone, or please don't use please please don't use profanity. I'd love to help you out. If it continues, I'm going to need to hang up the phone, and if it continues, then the conversation has ceased. But more often than not, we get uh, situations resolved. But same thing with your team. You know, make sure they're clear on the expectations, and if they're not meeting the standard, inform them and let them know what you expect, and let them know if it if it continues, what the consequences will be, and then of course you got to follow through. Because uh, anybody in here have children? <laughs> And if you say something, you've got to follow through, because if not, they're going to run you over. And then, of course, we've got to let go of the outcome, because people are going to be upset, but it's not so much at you. They're just going to be upset, you know, in general. Um, so the next question is this. So that's your staff. That's your team. The next one is, you know, are you honest with yourself and clear on the expectations of your role? Because I think a common shortcoming against in, in management is that people confuse management and leadership. Managers manage tasks. Leaders employ vision. And I think everybody in this room at some level has a leadership role. And again, it's not, it's in lean times that the manager feels they've got to pick up the slack. Again, that's not possible and that's not practical, nor is having you do those tasks uh, beneficial to the, to the forward movement of the, the group, the department, or the institution. Um, so one, you know, an extremely beneficial exercise, this has helped me tremendously, just kind of clear the clutter. Um, an extremely beneficial exercise is a brain dump. And really all you do is you take all the activities that you would do on a yearly basis, quarter, month, week, and day. So on a yearly basis, that might be everything. I pay my taxes on a yearly basis. I take a vacation. I meet with my financial advisor. I do staff evaluations. Write down all of your core duties and get other people to help you out, whether that's your team or that's your family. Try to find out all the things that you're doing and then you begin going through that list and you eliminate all those things you can eliminate. You know, sometimes we just do things because we've always done them. Then we delegate. Who else can be doing these? You know, there are people down the chain that can be doing these activities. And then, of course, we focus on the areas that are going to be most beneficial to us and they're going to be most beneficial to moving the department and moving the organization forward. You know, you look at the military and how are they building their leaders? They build them from inside out, right? And not allowing your team to more responsibility is really doing them a disservice. And at some level, you're actually stunting their growth. So get really clear on the expectations of your role. Uh, you'll be experiencing better, better self-care and you'll be providing better and stronger leadership in a time where it's very much needed. Uh, so just take a moment. I want you guys just to write down uh, something that pertains to expectations, whether that's reviewing um, job duties with your team, whether that's looking at your core duties, whether that maybe it's even reviewing your own job description and your own responsibilities and how you can best spend your time, or maybe it's a, something that has to do with communication.
Okay, your D is downtime. And with downtime, a major mistake is failing to schedule downtime. We live in busy, busy times, right? We're accessible all the time. We've got cell phones now. People can get a hold of us all the time. There's always something to do on the to-do to -do list, and the to-do list is never finished. I mean, think about this. Over the past four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, how many times have you said to yourself, I have finished everything. There's now nothing to do, right? It doesn't happen. So the downtime doesn't show up, and that's why it's critically important that we do schedule that. And it's Dr. Carlo Slavi from Wake Forest University. She talks about stress, and, and um, she says, you know, we really need to, to value stress reduction. And the problem in our society is we don't. In fact, we value the opposite. We value the person who can just go, 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 right? They multitask. Not only can they do two things at once, but they can do five things at once. And we sit back in amazement like they're some type of superhero. Multitasking is actually detrimental to your health, and it's a negative thing. It's, not, it's a very stressful way to live, certainly not somebody who's practicing self-care. She also then goes on to say that you know, this stress, you know, valuing stress reduction is not, like a, it's not an abstract idea that we should just think about doing it someday, sometime. She says it's something we need to address right now because not only is it f affecting today's health, but it's also affecting your health for, for years to come. So what really happens when we're under stress? You know, as I talked about earlier, your nervous system and your endocrine system, those really, those are your control centers in the body, and they work together. If you stress your, ner your nervous system, your endocrine system will be affected and vice versa. So we've all had a nervous stomach, right, from emotional stress. Well, when this is happening, you've got nerve tension in the abdominal area. These nerves are actually stimulating your adrenals, nervous system stimulating your endocrine system. Your adrenals are pumping out stress hormones, they're pumping out these, these uh, cortisol, they're pumping out adrenaline, and that's what shocks you into action, into fight or flight. And as you can see, you know, in this example, of course, he's being chased by a bull, but that's what we experience all day, you know, this, this stress where we're continually uh, stimulating all this adrenaline. But uh, again, the adrenaline uh, is released and shocks your body into action. And, uh, this is why you get an upset stomach. This is why you get digestive issues when you're underneath this emotional stress. But the nerve tension in the abdominal area also corresponds with the pancreas. And the pancreas is very important for the production of glucose. Now, your brain thrives on glucose. So when this, actu when this happens, we begin shuttling the glucose to the muscles, right, to prepare us for fight or flight. So this is why we get a little confused, or this is why we're spacey, or this is why we're not able to concentrate when we're under a lot of emotional stress. So you know, this chronic or habitual process really leads to burnout. And burnout's a large byproduct of we're meeting everybody else's needs, but not our own. And what are some effective strategies or tools for, for handling burnout? Actually, exercise and deep breathing. Those are going to be your two key core strategies for handling stress, uh, handling burnout. Because when we're in this um, uh, negative emotional state, again, that creates tension. And the tension constricts and interferes with the normal balancing of the body. A lot of this nerve tension is going to be is stored in our muscle as well as our nerve tissue. So these deep rhythmic breathing techniques actually allows us to release this stress. And it's not only the stress that's been pent up today, but we're also actually releasing stress that's been pent up for years. So when we're in that fight or flight state, you're, again, you're literally bathing in stress hormones. But when we do these relaxation technology or uh, strategies, we're doing the opposite. We're in a very peaceful state. We're in a very healing state. We're in a very uh, comforting state. So when we talk about downtime. I mean, there's a host of things that we can do, right? Uh, for me personally, I've used meditation. Uh, I used to not take a lunch break. I did that for about a decade. I would eat lunch, but I would just be hammering away on the computer. Um, it's, it's, number one, it's unproductive, it's not healthy. Um, now what I do, I'll actually walk out to the parking lot. I take my car and I drive all the way to the back of the lot, nobody's back there. I'll eat my lunch in quiet, I get some headphones, I do some uh, guided meditations, uh, sit there in some peace and quiet because I'm around commotion all day, I'm in interaction all day, and then I gotta go home and I got two wild kids to contend with. But you can do anything. I mean, anything that allows you to relax, catch your breath, normalize and stabilize blood chemistry, you got somebody who's playing an, uh, an instrument, uh, a massage, might even be, you know, just 
You know, all these things tie together from communication, expectations, environments. Maybe every Tuesday night's a, a rough day and you want to come home and you just want to take a bath by candlelight, some soft music, whatever. Uh, but that's stuff, obviously, you communicate with those who you, who you work with. This fire down here, um, that actually reminds me of, I worked with a big time CEO one time. And uh, he worked six weeks straight, 42 days straight, 10, 12, 14 hour days. And then he would take two weeks off. And I asked him, I said, what do you do? He goes, well, I just go up to my cabin in Maine. He goes, I just look at the fire most of the time. But it was something that allowed him to relax and rejuvenate. And this one might be even the most important. Laugh, have some fun, get together with people. But again, you got to get this stuff scheduled. If it's not scheduled, time's going to pass you by. Research shows that kids laugh hundreds of times per day. Adults, it's only about 17 times per day. So, you know, is it... Um, Having fun, is it, is it immature, is it grow up? Not really, you know, I think I, I, I love when uh, uh, people have fun and they make, they make fun. So purposely schedule that. And then the final one is this, is sleep. And I just wanna share a brief story because this, is, uh, this was a huge goal of mine and people kinda laugh at that, they're like, you had a sleeping goal? Um, for 22 years, I was chronically sleep deprived. I started as a paper boy back in, I think, 1985. Um, so I did that for six years, and then I got into college, and we got these big driving routes, which means we got up even earlier. Uh, then I graduated from college, and I got into a, an occupation. I chose an occupation with split schedules, right? I had you working at 6 a.m. to sometimes 10 p.m. Um, then my schedule began to solidify, and I had children. So I, w I went through this horrible cycle that I had to, uh, it was something I had to consciously focus on. But with sleep, American Cancer Society shares with us that um, back in 1960, we used to sleep about eight hours a night. Now it's down to about 6.7. Um, and there's, a, you know, again, all of this stuff, sleep really is stress. And that's when your endocrine system and your nervous system really have an opportunity to recover and rejuvenate. Uh, but it has been shown just a single night of sleep deprivation, increased mood swings, short temperedness, decreased attention, memory, and speed with which you think. Um, four hours over six days, you're already in a pre diabetic state increased hunger, um, increased risk of heart disease, increased risk of blood pressure, stroke. Again, sleep deprivation is stress. And there's a growing body of research now just sharing the importance and the significance of sleep. But um, what I'd like to close with is just this quote. Uh, one of my favorites is just that I've learned that people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And your ability to influence and your ability to impact will always come down to the amount of positive energy that you circulate. There's no way that you can do this. There's no way that you can impact. There's no way that you can influence. There's no way that you can really fulfill this mission statement unless and until you meet your needs. So I hope at some level I've been able to influence you, impact you. I hope I've given you some food for thought. Um, I want to thank you. I wish you well. You guys have been awesome.